Welcome to 120, March 26, 2019. Last week we covered, we reviewed for the first half of our Zoom session, we reviewed some of the anatomy of the inner ear and cochlea. And then for the second half of the last Zoom session, we got into the physiology of the inner ear or cochlea. And I believe we wound ourselves down to the bottom of page one in our notes. And we described the motions of movement inside the cochlea. So let's kind of take a look at where we were. And then we'll start from there and carry on. Lots of what we talked about, if I blow up this particular slide here, if it'll let me, see if I can. I'm here. Let's see if I can go here. Okay. Ah, now, there we are. Okay, you are looking at the left especially, the green and the red arrows. So, when the foot plate of the stapes pushes in and out of the oval window, you are moving fluid in the scala vestibuli. And that fluid motion going around and around and up, and then down through the helicotrema, and then around and out and out and out and out the scala tympani to wiggle the round window. So the scala vestibuli is associated with the oval window. The scala tympani is associated with the round window. Sideways picture. So when you're, so now look at kind of how we can summarize the various motions of taking place inside the cochlea. Okay, going back to this one here, notice how I call these arrows the horizontal movement. And this would be the vertical movement, the up and down motion of the scala media, specifically the indentation of Reissner's membrane and the, the bulging or indentation of the basilar membrane. And it's this vertical motion that creates, that, that excites the hair cells. There's where the hair cells get, become activated. And if that horizontal, if that vertical motion might take place here or here, or here, wherever that vertical motion takes place, that is where the hair cells are stimulated. And that's why we say the cochlea is tonotopic. Specific frequencies are represented in specific places. So if the peak of the traveling wave, the wave of motion going through the cochlea, think of the traveling wave as like a transverse fluid wave. It is a ripple taking place. And where is that ripple taking place? Along the scala media. And that ripple grows bigger into a point and then stops. And wherever that point is, wherever that wave gets largest, that whole thing is called the traveling wave. And that ripple of excitation along the floor and along the ceiling of the scala media, that may, that'll take place around the base or it might take place around the middle or the top. The ripple creates a peak. And wherever the peak of that wave occurs, those are the hair cells that are stimulated. Going to here, here's a cochlea unrolled. Foot plate of the stapes pushing in and out of the oval window. Shown here, the little black thing, okay? There's your horizontal motion of fluid going around the helicotrema and then bolt going back out to move the round window. Call this black line the scala media, okay? If you take a cross section here, you'd be looking scala vestibuli, scala media, scala tympani. Scala vestibula, scala vestibuli, scala media, scala tympani. Okay, there's that motion, that vertical motion. So the movement of fluid this way creates an indentation along the basilar membrane or along the uh, scala media. And most of the time in drawings, they simply draw a flat line like this and mainly highlight on the basilar membrane. Okay, that's usually what people do, just to make things simpler. Okay, so call this black line the basilar membrane, and the horizontal motion of fluid creates an indentation or a vertical up and down motion. And it's wherever that vertical up and down motion takes place, those are the hair cells that are stimulated. That may take place at the base, then you hear a high frequency sound. If it takes place here, you have a mid frequency sound. And if that motion takes place here, you have a low frequency sound. Very important. And also, 
how, H-O-W, why, W-H-Y, why does a horizontal motion of fluid create a vertical indentation somewhere along the basilar membrane at some unique place, why? And the reasons why is because the, the, the scala vestibuli gets narrower and narrower as you get toward the apex of the cochlea. And so you've got a pressure buildup, and that pressure buildup is going to have to bend something in order for the fluid to move. Something's got to give, because this area here is wider than this area here. And what's going to give is the membranous portion of, this, of the cochlea. And the membranous labyrinth of the cochlea is the scala media. Reissner's membrane, basilar membrane. Bony labyrinth, bony labyrinths, membranous labyrinths. The only place that can give is where there's movement of membranes, that they're, they're softer. So this will give at some place. This dotted or dashed line is called a traveling wave. Now you're looking at an rolled and an unrolled cochlea once again. Scala media here, often called the cochlear duct. Boring picture. And again, the base high frequencies, the mid, mid frequencies, the apex hair cells represent the low frequencies. And notice how they're just calling this the basilar membrane. All they're doing is concentrating on, whoops, this membrane here. They're just looking there. And why? Because that's the floor upon which the hair cells stand. Okay, great. This is another picture. Motion of the foot plate of the stapes in the round in the oval window. Mo horizontal movement shown by the arrows is going to result in an up and down movement, vertical movement, someplace along the basilar membrane. There's that indentation once again. Indentation of the basilar membrane and even motion along the tectorial membrane. That whole scala media gets activated and it might be activated here or here or here. It's wherever that traveling wave stops. Yet another picture. Motion of, of the, uh, t the foot plate of the stapes, it might cause the vertical motion to take place here or the vertical motion to take place here. Uh, once again, in illustrating the horizontal movement in the blue areas and the vertical movement in the pink and green areas. Rather strange looking thing, almost looks like a whale's teeth or something, but hair cells, I guess, are supposed to be shown here. I guess this would be the basilar membrane area and supporting cells, hair cells themselves, um, tectorial membrane here, I guess Reissner's membrane here, kind of getting to, it helps to kind of get an orientation, but admittedly it is rather complex. Outer ear canal, eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes, once again showing you the horizontal movement and then the corresponding vertical movement occurring someplace at any unique place along the basilar membrane. High frequency hair cell stimulation here, low frequency hair cell stimulation here. So now without any further, oh yes, and when that gets activated, when you have this up and down motion, have a close-up look, because what's happening is the whole thing gets bent. This is at rest, and this is when the whole scala media gets bent due to the peak of the traveling wave. Notice that the hairs become sheared. And it's very important to note, too, that the, it's not just like this. Think about it like, okay, much like that. You've got two hinges, one here and one at the top. I'll show it to you once again when we share screen. Two hinges, one here, one here. Okay, not just like one hinge here where my palms are together. Otherwise, nothing would happen to the hairs there. Okay, nothing would happen. Okay, it's when you've got this motion happening. That's what I mean by the two hinges. Basilar membrane and scala media at rest, and scala media as activated by the peak of the traveling waves, which shears or bends the hairs of the hair cells themselves, thus sending an electrical current up 
the eighth nerve to the brainstem. Let's look at notes now and see where we are. In our notes, we moved all the way down, and let's just read this paragraph again. It's a great paragraph. All sounds entering the cochlea. Now, we, please, we, we note that sounds don't enter a cochlea, okay? Sound waves at 250 hertz tone is four and a half feet long, so it's not going to get into a one inch long cochlea. So all sounds activating the cochlea travel in a, cause a traveling or a ripple wave along the basilar membrane, which goes from the base to the apex. The waves travel hundreds of times slower than sound in air, taking several milliseconds to complete a journey of a few millimeters over the sensory hair cells. Each individual frequency component wave grows in, what do we mean by that? You know, just usually have one traveling wave. You've got thousands of them because you've got thousands of different frequencies, okay? Each individual frequency component wave grows in intensity as it moves up the cochlea, eventually reaching a peak before coming to a complete stop at a unique place along the basilar membrane. Remember the names here, von Beckesy, Gold, Kemp that we discovered, that we talked about last week. Very important in historical development. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know what's happening here? Weird. Anyway, all right. How does the traveling wave work? Well, last week, this is what we talked about. Okay, this is exactly what we've been describing as the horizontal and vertical movements of fluid. The stapes unrolled and cross section, all of that. Okay, there you have it. Okay, and again, that, that, that talk of that paragraph is shown. Basically, here, that's, that's what they're showing here. This particular picture refers to this particular paragraph. Okay, there you go. Intensity would affect the size of a traveling wave. I mean, the wave peak is going to be taller with a more intense sound, smaller, with a soft sound, but the location of the peak, that determines what frequency you hear. Intensity affects the size of the traveling wave. So let's look at traveling waves versus sound waves. Traveling waves versus sound waves. You've got two different waves, okay? Sound waves, as you learned in 110, are longitudinal waves. Remember the picture of the tuning fork creating condensation rarefaction, condensation rarefaction of molecules. And we drew them as up and down because it was easier. But in all reality, of course, sound doesn't go up and down, okay? The squeezing and separating goes parallel to the plane in which the wave is traveling. Water waves are transverse waves. They really do go up and down, and they move in a direction. So the up and down motion is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is traveling, okay? So sound waves are longitudinal, traveling waves are transverse. Traveling waves are much like water waves. All right, here we go. Share screen and look at our notes. Traveling waves do not resemble sound waves in air. Think of a steady, pure tone. Its peaks are all the same amplitude. The resulting traveling wave, however, has one peak that stimulates specific places of hair cells. So in other words, if we're drawing sound waves like, and I'll show you here, okay? Okay. I'll stop sharing here. If we're drawing sound waves like that, there's a, there's a beep, a periodic tone. Could be a thousand hertz, who cares? Traveling waves ain't like that. Traveling waves would do this. Okay, the bottom one. So this sound will, may create in the cochlea a traveling wave looking like this. And the peak of that wave if I draw down, the peak of this wave would be stimulating hair cells in it, for example, at the 1000 hertz region of the cochlea. 
maybe in the middle, like not in the base, not at the apex, but somewhere in the middle. Okay, so if this was a thousand hertz tone, it would create a, a traveling wave in the cochlea that has a peak, and the peak would be over the 1000 hertz hair cells. That's the, what we mean by the relationship of sound waves versus traveling waves. Utterly different animals. One's a tiger, one's a lion. Okay, recall from acoustics sound waves are longitudinal, their condensations and rarefactions go in the same plane as the direction of the wave itself. Traveling waves are transverse waves like water waves. Their up and down motions occur perpendicular to the direction of the wave itself. Always remember, sounds do not enter the cochlea. Instead, sounds activate the cochlea. Incoming longitudinal waves cause internal transverse cochlear traveling waves. Think about it. A 250 hertz tone has a wavelength of four and a half feet. The unrolled cochlea is about an inch in length. There is no way 250 hertz tones can enter the cochlea. Traveling waves interact with the mass and stiffness properties of the basilar membrane, which results in peaks that occur along specific places along the basilar membrane. So remember now, as we've learned in anatomy, when you're looking at the scala media, it gets wider toward the narrow apex of the cochlea, and it's narrower at the wide base. Remember that? Always remember that. It's critical, okay? So the basilar membrane is wider at the narrow apex, and it's narrower at the wide base of the cochlea. You've got one row of hair, inner hair cells all the way up the cochlea, but you have three rows of outer hair cells at the base, four rows of outer hair cells at midway, and five rows of outer hair cells at the apex. Okay, so at the apex of the cochlea, the basilar membrane has more mass. At the apex of the cochlea, the whole scala media is bigger, and the walls are less stiff. And what's going to resonate mass? Lows. Okay? What's going to, and at the base of the cochlea, the whole basilar membrane and scala media itself has less mass. It's smaller. And the walls are more stiff. And that's why highs are going to resonate that area. So high frequency waves or sound waves will create a traveling wave that whoop, ends, at the, ends at the base because that's where the high frequencies resonate. And low frequency sounds will create longer traveling waves, and they'll find their home, their, the peak of low frequency sounds will create, or low, I should say low frequency sounds will create a traveling wave that and travels slowly up the basilar membrane and finds its home, its peak at the apex of the cochlea, because that's where low frequencies resonate. All right, good. Okay, back to sharing screen and notes. Cochlea is tonotopic due to the mass and stiffness properties of the basilar membrane and whole scale media itself. Now let's look at those traveling waves a little closer. And when we look at traveling waves, we need to note that they are asymmetrical. And I always say they're shaped like kites. So let's look at this in, in a picture. This is showing it kind of too. It's asymmetrical, isn't it? But let's look better. Closer. There you go. Here's two traveling waves. Make it bigger. Base of the cochlea, high frequencies. Apex of the cochlea, low frequencies. A 2000 hertz tone in the ear, hitting the ear, will create a traveling wave looking like this. Notice how it's shaped like a kite. Steep front, longer tail. There's its peak. Okay, so it's going to stimulate the hair cell region of 2000 hertz. A lower frequency sound activating the cochlea will create another asymmetrical traveling wave shape, but the peak will occur further up the basilar membrane. But either way, the steep front always faces the apex. The shallow longer tail faces or slopes toward the base, the highs. 
always never forget that okay so these the, what I'm, we're, what we're doing here is we're drawing the envelope See where my cursor is? That's the outline of the wave itself, the traveling wave envelope. And this one, the traveling wave envelope. All we're doing is connecting the dots, okay? Let's have another shot here. Traveling waves, basilar membrane displacement as a function of frequency. Here's the cochlea, here's the cochlea unrolled. And here's the basilar membrane. A 3000 hertz tone will have a peak here. A 1600 will have a peak here, 300 hertz having a peak here, 50 hertz having a peak here. Okay, notice this has more mass as you get toward the apex. And what's wrong with this picture is I wish they would have drawn this white area as getting wider toward the base, but I guess they're just showing the scale of media. I guess that's all they're showing here. So remember the, 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 uh, scale of vestibuli and base and scale of tympani are going to get wider this way okay anyway unrolled cochlea looking in the opposite direction kind of weird hey here's the outer ear canal malleus incus stapes oval window here's a, a weird semicircular canal they don't look like that obviously but it's just a schematic so when you're looking at the motion you're having a low frequency Here's a traveling wave. Mid frequency, here's the traveling wave. High frequency, here's its traveling wave. Once again, a close up of the envelopes, the shapes of the waves. If the apex is to the left, notice how the waves are always shaped like kites. Okay, shallow tail toward the base, steep front toward the apex, and with the peak at the, as the highest point. So a high frequency wave, a mid frequency wave, a low frequency wave. Each of these are traveling wave envelopes caused by low frequency sounds. Always remember, sound waves don't enter a cochlea. They create traveling waves in the cochlea. Here's a, the word information. This the word information. And look at all the traveling waves. In if you if this is the apex. And this is the base. In why low frequency? Look at where the peaks are toward the apex. Because I'm saying a vowel sound, which is low frequencies. Here's the letter F. Tiny little traveling waves confined to the base. For me, high frequency consonants again. Little tiny traveling waves here information so time is going down and this is the length of the basilar membrane showing changes or the ripples that are taking place over time okay this isn't the cochlea unrolled it is showing you at any instant in time where the waves are taking place as one says the word information now we should talk more about the upward spread of masking. But one second here, let's make sure we're keeping with where our notes are saying. So let's look at our notes. All right. Asymmetrical traveling wave for three frequencies. Note how the tail is shallow and long. The wave front is steep and short. Trace its shape to show its envelope, much like a kite. The steep wave front faces the apex, the low frequency region, the shallow slope faces the base. This results in what is called the upward spread of masking. Put a star by that. Upward spread of masking. In plain English, it means that lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Masking just refers to covering up one sound with another one. Notice how hard it's hard, how hard it is to hear in a bar. Well, it's because the low, the background noise is masking what you're trying to hear, okay? Noise covering other sounds is called masking. Lows cover or mask highs better than highs mask lows. Background noise is mostly low frequency. High frequency consonants of speech, s, ch, k, p, that's the sounds that tell you what the words were. Those are little china teacups, high frequency sounds. Dainty, special, soft, and lows are like the bowl in the china shop, okay? 
Background noise is mostly low frequency. And lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Let's look at this now in a, in a picture. Upward spread of masking. Here's a low frequency traveling wave envelope. The dashed lines and the wave itself is shown solid. Okay, so here's a traveling wave caused by a low frequency sound. On the right, in light blue, is a traveling wave caused by a high frequency sound. Both are asymmetrical. Okay. And on the top of each wave, you will have a point. And that point is the action of the outer hair cells. Outer hair cells help inner hair cells do two things, okay? Outer hair cells are not much connected to the eighth nerve. Outer hair cells do not send info to the brain. Inners do. Without inner hair cells, you are deaf, okay? You got no hearing. Inners are afferent, sending info to the brain. Why do you have outers? You have outer hair cells to help the inner hair cells pick up soft sounds. Sounds that are softer than 50 dB. If you didn't have outer hair cells, you wouldn't be able to hear 40, 30, 20, and 10. But you would be able to hear 60, 70, 80, and 90, and so forth. Presbycusis, hearing loss due to the elderly. Noise-induced hearing loss. Both of those kill outer hair cells leaving you with an inability to hear sounds softer than 50. Most hearing loss is sensory neural, hair cell damage caused, and most of it's mild to moderate in degree, meaning the outer hair cells are damaged. Outer hair cells are the princesses. Outer hair cells die before inners. Age kills outer hair cells. Noise kills outer hair cells. Ototoxic drugs kill outer hair cells. Outer hair cells tend to die before inners. You know why? Because outer hair cells are the moving part. We'll talk about that in just a little bit later on, okay? Still got another half hour to go. So outer hair cells actually move. They move inside the cochlea. And their movement results in this. Increase in traveling wave peak amplitude. Increase in the traveling wave peak amplitude. And secondly, increasing the sharpness of the wave. Increasing the sharpness of the wave. Now, why is this better than this? This versus this this versus this. This is what von Beckesy discovered after World War II in his cadavers in the basement of Harvard Physiology Labs, okay, right after World War II. He won his Nobel Prize. But I call this, or this is called, passive traveling waves. Traveling waves that would be created by sound waves and that, that would be taking place along a basilar membrane or a scalar media without the action of the outer hair cells. Waves that would occur due to the mass and stiffness properties, high frequencies resonating with the, bit, with the stiffness, therefore the traveling wave travels from the entrance of the cochlea and stops near the base. Low frequency traveling waves begin at the base of the cochlea too, but they carry on and peak toward the apex because the scalar media and basilar membrane has more mass here and lows resonate with mass. So, but look at how broad these peaks are. Look at how broad and rounded this peak is. So how is this person supposed to distinguish the difference between 1,000 hertz and 1,001 hertz? Okay, or since we're in the low frequency regions, 250 hertz, 251 hertz, 252 hertz. Remember from 110, a couple hours ago, we talked about differential thresholds, the ability to distinguish between frequencies close together. If you have dead outer hair cells, okay, you won't be able to distinguish between frequencies close together because your traveling waves are dull and rounded. I mean, if we can hear from, let's say, 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 hertz, or even on the audiogram, 
from 125 to 8,000 hertz, okay? If your traveling waves are broad and dull and rounded, you're going to be stimulating a whole bunch of different hair cells close together. So these hair cells, of course, are all close together, and you're not just stimulating this hair cell. You know what I'm saying? You've got a dull, rounded peak. And that means poorer frequency resolution. That means you need to make a bigger difference in frequency for you to notice a difference in frequency. So the person with dull, rounded traveling waves actually has traveling waves like a dead person, like the cadavers that von Beckesee was experimenting with, literally, because the sharpening created by the outer hair cells is gone. The hair cells are dead because the person has, is dead. So people who have damaged outer hair cells have cochleas that work like dead people's. They're, it's a passive traveling wave. Yep, you'll get high frequency and low frequency stimulation, but the peaks of the waves aren't sharp. So now back to what we have, have in our PowerPoint here. Traveling waves occurring without outer hair cells and traveling waves occurring with outer hair cells. And notice the two-fold rule. Number one, outer hair cells increase the amplitude. And number two, outer hair cells increase the sharpness. So now this person can, C-A-N, can distinguish between frequencies close together, whereas this person cannot. This person's delta F, or just noticeable difference, when you're looking in differential thresholds at the beginning of unit four in acoustics, this person here has a poorer frequency resolution and therefore has a harder time separating speech from background noise wearing hearing aids. And that's the big rub here, okay? So people don't get about hearing aids, okay? Hearing aids can't sharpen peaks of traveling waves. You can't. How can they do that? It's impossible. Okay. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, had a great fall. All the king's horses and men couldn't put Humpty together again. When the cochlea is broken, it's broken. Okay. So hearing aids, they can make sounds louder in specific frequencies where the person specifically needs them. Yep. You can tune hearing aids to provide treble amplification, mid frequency, low frequency. Heck, they're digital. You can sculpt and shape the frequency response of a hearing aid to match a person's hearing loss. Where the hearing loss drops, the hearing aid amplification can begin. No problemo. We solved that one 50 years ago, okay? We can't create new traveling waves because you can't grow new hair cells. When the outers are gone, they're gone. When the inners are gone, they're gone, okay? So... All we can do with hearing aids, because the person with damaged hair cells is going to have a harder time separating speech from noise, because he's got dull, rounded traveling waves instead of sharp traveling wave peaks. His frequency resolution is more broad, okay? He's going to have a harder time separating speech from background noise. So, hearing aids have directional mics, and they have digital noise reduction to try and increase what's called the signal to noise ratio to increase the intensity of speech compared to background noise by picking up sounds in the direction the person's facing by trying to reduce the background noise you can increase the amplification for speech compared to the noise and in that way that's what's called increasing the signal to noise ratio okay and that's what needs to be done for the person with damaged hair cells, so that the person with the dull, rounded traveling waves can more easily separate speech from background noise. Why? Because you've increased the signal to noise ratio. So hearing aids have a twofold task. One, amplify, and two, increase signal to noise ratio, because outer hair cells are gone. And the outer hair cells, twofold role, amplification, eep, well, we can amplify and bring that back, but the sharpening of the traveling wave, that's gone too. We can't bring that back. So all we can do is increase the signal to noise ratio. There you go. All right, where were we now? PowerPoint slides, there we are. So now let's talk about the upward spread of masking. The upward spread of masking. 
lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. We talked about outer hair cells sharpening the wave, and that was kind of a diversion because we were first going to be talking about this. And I showed you this slide here in the asymmetrical ways. Look at this, this upward spread of masking, but then suddenly we talked about outer hair cells sharpening the waves. Let's go back to the shape of the envelopes. Let's pretend. There's a truck idling outside of your house. And in your kitchen, you have a canary in a cage. And the canary's making soft peeping sounds. Beep, 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 singing high frequencies. The loud, low frequency truck, the traveling waves caused in your cochlea by that loud, low frequency truck, the envelope will over, if this is the canary's traveling wave, this envelope of the loud rumbling truck will cover up or mask the high frequency canary, thereby covering the high frequency canary and you won't hear it. Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Look, you can have the soft rumbling of a truck outside and your canary can be now hairy, hairy canary, really mad, beep, 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 beep. she can peep all she wants, or he can peep all he wants, but that traveling wave, yep, it's going to get bigger, but it ain't going to go out here. See what I'm saying? Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows, okay? And it's only because of the shape of the traveling waves. They're a frickin metrical. That's why you have upward spread of masking. Okay, just look at the pictures. A loud low truck can mask the soft peeping of a canary better than the loud peeping of a canary can mask the soft rumbling of a truck. Very important concept to grasp. Ah, oh, let's see. Yeah, and look at this. You're going to have a low frequency hearing. Look at this low frequency hearing loss. This is right ear. The O's represent the right ear. This is just an example. And it's, I'm going to talk more about this in 125 hearing disorders this summer. But look at the implications of having asymmetrical traveling waves. Let's just look at the implications of it. Let's say that every hair cell below 1,000 hertz, inner and outers, were ripped out of your cochlea. Okay, you've got no low frequency hearing at all, none, okay? And then you do have high frequency hair cells. All the lows are dead and the highs are living. Do you think you're gonna have hearing thresholds that are way down here and then normal hearing up here? Uh-uh. If I make a sound about 60 decibels in the low frequency region and the peak of the traveling wave is stimulating low frequency hair cells, the tail of the wave is still covering high frequency living hair cells. The person's going to raise his hand. He's hearing 250 hertz with remote living hair cells. That's why this is called a low frequency dead region and audiometry. Even if your hair cells were totally dead here, if I tested you in the morning, your hearing loss would look like this. Why? Because of the shape of the traveling wave envelope. High frequency dead regions. Let's say like a thief in the night, I came in and ripped out every hair cell above a thousand hertz. Yep, then your hearing would look more like you'd expect, but it would really drop too because if I presented a thousand hertz, the front of the wave might stimulate living hair cells. And if I went further into the dead area, I'd have to dramatically increase the intensity so that the front of the wave still stimulated lower frequency living hair cells. And if I went further into the dead region, I'd really have to increase the intensity for the front of the wave to still stimulate living low frequency or mid frequency hair cells. And that's why high frequency dead regions are associated with a precipitous drop in hearing, whereas low frequencies are associated with a moderate rising audiogram, all due to the shape of the traveling wave. 
So let's go back to our notes. That's kind of high level stuff, but let's go look at our notes now. Asymmetrical traveling wave, we've covered that. Upward spread of masking. Asymmetrical traveling wave results in two more asymmetrical things. Asymmetrical tuning curves of the eighth nerve, asymmetrical psychophysical tuning curves that we will cover later on in acoustics in our last unit, our second last unit. And asymmetrical tuning curves, we'll be looking at that in about two weeks' time. Not now, okay? But asymmetrical traveling wave has echoes or repercussions further up the system. For now, let's look at the shearing action of the stereocilia seen close up. Okay, here's our picture. Notice the tectorial membrane on the top, basilar membrane on the bottom, hinge and hinge. Here too, hinge and hinge. Tectorial membrane, outer hair cells, inner hair cells, basilar membrane, at rest on the bottom. And notice that the stereocilia or hairs of the outer hair cells are jammed into the underside of the tectorial membrane, whereas the hairs of the inner hair cells aren't. Okay, there's reasons for it. We'll talk about that. But outer hair cells take info from the brain to help the inner hair cells pick up soft sounds below 50 and also to sharpen the peaks of the traveling waves, okay? So when uh, the cochlea is stimulated, the peak of the traveling wave will cause this motion to take place somewhere along the basilar membrane, somewhere along the scala media, either at the base or in the middle or at the apex. And when you've got two hinges like this, you've got a shearing action, okay, from at rest to here. Here it is again, outer hair cells, inner hair cells, tectorial membrane. The top of it or the underside is connected to the stereocilia of the outer hair cells, but not really to those of the inner. Here is the tectorial membrane torn off so that you can see its underside. Here's, once, here's a, a stereocilia of the outer hair cells and look at the indentations into the underside of this tectorial membrane. So all we've done is torn this orange thing away and looked at its underside. Now let's look at what happens in the cochlea when sounds are activating it, especially if a soft sound below 50 is coming in. What you're seeing here is the motion of the outer hair cells, literally, whoops, the motion of the outer hair cells, stretching and shrinking. And because their stereocilia are jammed into the underside of the tectorial membrane, when they shrink, they pull this membrane down so that these hairs can be sheared or bent. See that? That's the motion of the outer hair cells. They literally are like the muscles of the cochlea. And when soft sounds activate the cochlea, somehow, we don't know exactly how. If you want to win a Nobel Prize, figure it out and tell us all how, because we don't know how it works. We just know that somehow they get a message when a soft sound is activating the cochlea to shrink, pull down the membrane so that it can activate the, the inner hair cells. If sounds are greater than 50 or 60 dB, then there's enough fluid motion taking place in the cochlea to move this hair cell, to move this, the, the stereocilia by themselves. But if sounds are less than 50 or 60, the mechanical help of the outer hair cells is required. And this action serves to sharpen and amplify the peak of the traveling wave. Okay? This action that the outer hair cells are doing right here serves to increase the amplitude and sharpen the peak of the traveling wave. A passive traveling wave, active traveling wave. Okay, the two-fold role of the outer hair cells. That's why they die first, because they're the moving part. 
Okay, that's why outers tend to die before inners. This person's got excellent frequency resolution, excellent difference Lyman for speech, excellent just noticeable difference in other words, excellent differential threshold for frequency, good frequency resolution, poor frequency resolution. And this is what most people wearing hearing aids have, a passive as opposed to an active traveling wave. Very important, outer hair cell contributions to the traveling wave. They amplify it and they sharpen it. Why hearing aids for ears ain't like glasses for eyes. Here's an unrolled cochlea stimulated by two frequencies. So he's got two traveling waves, nice sharp peaks, easily distinguished from each other. Frequencies close together, no problemo, okay? The middle panel is showing you damage to outer hair cells. So the peaks are gone, and now the waves are more rounded. When we put hearing aids on someone, we're making this middle traveling wave bigger, which is half the battle, but this is not brought back. Okay? The ability to distinguish between frequencies close together is diminished. And that's why hearing aids not only have to provide gain or amplification, as I'm circling here, but because they can't restore these peaks again, they have to somehow increase the signal-to-noise ratio, make the speech louder than the noise, so that the person with this damaged traveling waves, due to the hair cell damage, can separate frequencies close together. The actions done by the outer hair cells come with a price. In other words, this action here is amplification, isn't it? It results in amplified traveling waves. Amplification always comes at a cost. Whenever you're amplifying, you're having some distortion. When you produce a lot of light, you often have a lot of heat. Let's just look at each other here. Put your hand against a light bulb. Yikes, it's hot. The heat is a byproduct of the light. Work really hard and you sweat. Your sweat is a byproduct of your work. Well, the outer hair cells working their butts off, they also produce a byproduct. So your cochlea is a little amplifier, okay? The outer hair cells are its amplifier. And when they're amplifying, yep, they produce some distortion, some byproduct. And that byproduct is called oto ear acoustic sound emissions. Literally, backward traveling waves. Waves that are going back toward the footplate of the stapes. Not away, but toward hitting the footplate of the stapes, wiggling the middle ear ossicles, and now the eardrum is working like a speaker, and it's producing sounds, auto-acoustic emissions. You know why we can't hear them? Because the eardrum is bigger than the footplate of the stapes. Remember, if you're hitting the eardrum, that's force over a big area, that's converged onto a small area, right? Pressure is force over an area. So if the sound is coming in, yep, the middle ear increases the pressure because force hitting this big eardrum is converged onto the point of the footplate of the stapes. But if sound's going, or if a wave is going this way, okay, force over a tiny area, which is a lot of pressure, is dispersed over a wider area. Thank God, otherwise you'd be hearing your autoacoustic emissions. But OAEs are actually measured on people. They are good for testing babies, newborns. You can screen for hearing loss. And autoacoustic emissions take about five minutes to measure, no problem, okay? Also good for malingerers, people who are lying to you about what they say they hear. Autoacoustic emissions, if they have them, liar, liar, pants on fire, okay? Interesting. OAEs, autoacoustic emissions. That's why we showed you this slide.
the ear in reverse. The probe for autoacoustic emissions, quite similar to tympanometry that you will be learning in 140 audiometry or 130 audiometry. A tight seal isn't necessary. You're mainly blocking out the noise. But basically, here's your inner hair cells, outer hair cells, inner hair cells sending info up the eighth nerve to the brainstem. Outer hair cells receive info, remember this, from the olivocochlear bundle, from the superior olivary complexes of the brain stem, back to the outer hair cells. Inner hair cells are afferent, outer hair cells are efferent. By being efferent, they help the inner hair cells pick up sounds below 50, and they sharpen the peaks of the traveling waves. Autoacoustic emissions. Here's a probe stuck in someone's ear. You're delivering sounds to the eardrum, and a backward traveling wave is created. You put two frequencies close together in the ear. We don't need to go into any detail here. I'm just telling you in general. Distortion product autoacoustic emissions. Tone one and tone two separated by a certain ratio. We won't get into it today into the ear canal, into the middle ear, activating the cochlea, and the outer hair cells produce mm, a distortion, intermodulation product, going back through the ossicles, hitting the eardrum, and being picked up by a mic. That's how we measure autoacoustic emissions. A sound put in the ear, and another sound put in the ear, spread by a certain frequency difference, produces an autoacoustic emission. Pretty wild, huh? Let's see now, where are we and where are we in our notes so that we can close today's session because we'll describe more of this next week. Not a problem. So, note, look back to the shearing action. Basilar and tectorial membranes attached at different points. When vertical motion of the traveling wave, wave peak bends the scala media at some particular place, there's unequal movement of the basilar and tectorial membranes, which bends or shears the stereocilia. Don't worry about this stuff here at all. Just leave it alone. This is mainly to describe, basically, that what I've highlighted right here, if you want to write down in your margin, this stuff here explains why, I'm going way back here just so you can see it, explains why, and how come hair cell stimulation doesn't occur here or here? Why is it just at the peak? If you draw it even more here, how come this area doesn't cause hair cell, cell stimulation? Yeah, there's movement here. So how come this area doesn't cause hair cell stimulation? How come only the peak causes hair cell cell stimulation? How come you don't have less stimulation here and less here, but still some stimulation? That's what that area is talking about. But don't worry about it. I'll never ask it on a quiz or exam. Move on. Because we're almost done. Traveling wave and the twofold role of outer hair cells. Hey, we've already covered this. Look at that. Outer hair cells amplify sounds below 50 and they sharpen the traveling wave peak. Jug-shaped afferent inner hair cells are innervated by the eighth nerve. Their stereocilia don't touch the tectorial membrane. Without inner hair cells, we have no hearing, but inner hair cells by themselves cannot pick up sounds below 50. It's the test tube-shaped efferent outer hair cells innervated by the olivocochlear bundle. Their stereocilia are stuck or jammed into the underside of the tectorial membrane. Without them, we'd have about a 50 decibel sensory neural hearing loss. When sounds below 50 or 60, 50, 40 to 50, cross out, enter, activate, activate the cochlea. Then outer hair cells are somehow given a message to stretch or shorten, and we don't know how. They pull the tectorial membrane down so that inner hair cell stereocilia can touch it. 
von Bekesey discovered the passive traveling wave back in the 1940s and 50s. He only had cadavers to examine and dead people have dead hair cells. Gold suspected an active traveling wave, one that involved added input from the outer hair cells. Von Bekesey didn't believe him. Later on, Kemp discovered autoacoustic emissions, which come from the outer hair cells. He proved gold was right. Outer hair cells are the active cochlear mechanism. Their bodies tense and lax the basilar membrane in areas near the traveling wave peak, and as a result, they push and squeeze the motion into a point. They amplify and sharpen the filter action of the cochlea. Very sensitive they are. Real gas hogs. They are the first to die out with lack of oxygen, noise-induced hearing loss, and aging itself. Most sensory neural loss, for example, presbycusis, is caused by outer hair cell damage and death. So noise-induced hearing loss also causes outer hair cell damage. Inner hair cells tend to be protected and last longer. Most hearing loss is mild to moderate in degree because outer hair cells help inner hair cells pick up sounds below 50. So decibels softer than 50 indicates a mild to moderate loss. But the second piece of damage that occurs is not just the ability to not hear or the inability to hear sounds softer than 50, but also rounded traveling waves, therefore a poorer frequency resolution and more difficulty hearing in background noise. Thus, we end today's Zoom session on cochlear physiology. Next week, we will continue in cochlear physiology and finish this unit on cochlear physiology. We'll talk more about cochlear dead regions. We'll talk more about autoacoustic emissions. But for now, the main things to know of that we've covered so far is the horizontal movement giving way to the vertical movement. And that vertical movement is shown by the peak of the traveling wave. That's, what, that's where the vertical movement occurs. That peak will happen at some unique place along the basilar membrane due to the mass and stiffness properties of the basilar membrane as you move from the base toward the apex. Then we needed to, we looked at the asymmetrical shapes of the traveling waves and, brought, and upward spread of masking lows masking highs better than highs masking lows and then we touched on outer hair cells amplifying and sharpening the peaks of the traveling waves and how a byproduct of their action is caused by or it results in autoacoustic emissions so if someone has damaged outer hair cells you will not have autoacoustic emissions. If you have autoacoustic emissions, you have functioning outer hair cells. We'll talk more and finish this unit next week. For now, I'll stop recording and end the session here.